Okay. Good afternoon to everybody and welcome to our uh, weekly seminar series of the Department of Marine Geosciences. Um, and we are very honored to host uh, this week uh, Professor Gerrit Lohmann from the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research, AWI, in Germany. So, some words about uh, Professor Lohmann. So, Gerrit Lohmann is at the, currently at the ABI for Polar and Marine Research, as I mentioned, since 2004, and represents the topic uh, physics of the climate system at the University of Bremen. Gerrit Lohmann studied physics and mathematics at the University of Göttingen and Marburg. Gerrit Lohmann was a doctoral student at ABI and a guest research at the Hear Science Center at the University of Gothenburg. In 1995, he completed his doctoral thesis on the stability of the ocean circulation. In 1996, uh, Gerrit turned to the field of Earth systems modeling at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg until 2000. In the following uh, years, he worked at several institutions, including the geosciences at um, the University of Bremen, Meteorological Institute in Hamburg, and the Center for Marine Environmental Sciences in Bremen. He was head of a junior research group as part of a promotion of young researchers at German climate research. Gerrit also is involved in the organization of nation, national and international symposia, such as the United States Academy of Sciences, Humboldt Foundation, European Geophysical Union, and so on. And initiated, he also initiated national and international research projects. He has published more than 300 articles in international journals, in the field of climate modeling and data interpretation. He had several short-term research days, conference contributions, and teaching at summer winter schools. And finally, he supervised more than 50 students and 30 PhDs at the University of Hamburg and Bremen. His field of work includes the development of an analysis of complex models for simulating abrupt climate transitions from transition from ice age to warm period, and future climate conditions. So um, with this short introduction, uh, we're again very honored to host you, Gerrit, and, and the podium is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. And it's also a great honor for me uh, to be at least online. I was in Haifa uh, more than um, 30 years ago. It, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I worked there in a kibbutz close to Haifa. Um, today, my um, talk is about uh, lessons from the past. What can we learn from climate records, from models? And be aware what we know really from the climate is also very limited. Here is the Northern Hemisphere uh, temperature uh, record shown for the last 130 years or so. And you see here um, variability and up and downs. And of course, there's also a little trend on top of that. Um, so what is, um, first, my institute, it's located in Bremerhaven, which is at the coast in northern uh, North Sea. Um, then we have also some um, other um, stations in Potsdam, in Sylt and Helgoland on these little islands and recently on in Oldenburg. Um, so my uh, hometown is, or my town now is Bremen. It's a very old town with nice um, streets and also the big harbor and Bremerhaven is just the translation of the harbor of Bremen and that's a view onto the North Sea. So you're invited to come, it's, it's a very nice area. Um, we have also um, ships and um, stations in, in the, mainly in the polar latitudes. Here the French, uh, German uh, bases on Spitzbergen, but also in Antarctica, um, the most uh, famous or the biggest one is Neumeyer station where we obtain um, new data sets, and also uh, there's a permanent um, uh, a polar station. And um, this big ship of Avi that is going back and forth um, on each um, 
summer season and this mosaic expedition a couple of years ago now that was a year round in the arctic ocean to to get uh, also insights and to, to the seasonal cycle and processes in in the arctic ocean yeah what is um the data we are looking at um uh, sea ice fraction data um you see here in the north uh, we have a decline of sea ice fraction in the past um, decades, along with the temperature increase at high latitudes. But we also see we have very limited information in the Arctic and even worse in the Antarctic in sea ice um, that is just filled up with um, climatology. So our knowledge is rather limited, especially at high latitudes. And I call that the climate dilemma. So the instrumental data are sparse. You see here the shipping routes where we have basically the uh, long-term sea surface temperature data from. Uh, the records are also relatively short and even worse, they fall already in the face of hu strong human influence. So basically what we see now or in, uh, in the last 100 years is already uh, pertur the perturbed climate and therefore um, we need um, uh, information before the instrumental records that one has to rely on information of uh, proxy data and uh, climate modeling. So just to give you an example, how can we interpret um, instrumental data and how can we bring that into long-term context? Here is um, the crew temperature data from um, from also the, on the instrumental period. If we subtract northern and southern hemisphere temperatures, we see quite interesting interdecadal variability, and we can associate that with a strong and weak um, um, amok circulation in the ocean. I will come to that later. That is uh, 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 somehow well known that we have cool cold phases, for instance, in the seventies, um, and 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 the cold phase in the North Atlantic, which might be related to weakening of of the ocean circulation. And you can look at this period, and you see indeed that was a cold period in the North Atlantic, and also parts of our uh, um, also in the North Pacific. And at the same time, um, a relative warming in the Southern Hemisphere. And also we see shifts in the ITZZ, so in rainfall uh, over the Zahir region, um, also accompanied by this shift in temperature gradient across the latitudes. And there is also specific uh, time period. The South is, is uh, somehow lagging here the north, the northern is cooling and the south is warming. So this type of um, um, temperature signal is also seen in ice cores. I will come to that. Um, ice cores, they are um, provide a very interesting and long-term evolution. I, I will concentrate here only on relatively shallow ice cores uh, taken in Greenland. And um, the question is, what is a Greenland recording? And um, recently we find um, 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 that this warming in Greenland has um, now appeared in uh, the, it's the warming, the global warming has now appeared in Greenland. So this little red part here of this temperature increase in northern Greenland is really outstanding in terms of the last thousand years where we see a small a cooling trend and here a small warming trend, but the last um, decades are really outstanding. What is not really clear, what is the result, what is the reason for this variability in on, on decadal or multi-decadal timescales, um, these oscillations is this is probably related to atmospheric circulation and um, and uh, it can be compared to marine sediment data compiled also by Arctic 2K network and this um, recent decades 
are really uh, standing out. And um, also one can ask then ourselves, okay, is there, has this influence on meltwater runoff from Greenland and, and freshening, but this is still ongoing work. Um, if we see now our tools, I mean, we have marine sediments, but we have also ice core drilling, uh, lake sediments, and also in conjunction with modeling. And I will mostly talk about modeling and its use for um, what we can learn from, from the past in conjunction with, with the data. So this models, uh, it, it, what is a good thing, we have a relatively good theoretical basis. Uh, that means we have uh, the equations, we know what kind of um, uh, formulations we have to solve. Unfortunately, we cannot solve the equations uh, analytically um, and we have to make uh, approximations. But what we can do is uh, create a mesh um, um, and we create the modern type of circulation models. This is one example what we are using. Um, we can create a mesh or resolution structure which has high resolution along the high latitudes because we believe or we have indications that the high latitudes are very important for climate change as well as the coastal areas. And you see here, the higher here on the coastal side here in the coast of Portugal, it has some higher resolution than off the coast where we have a course of resolution of maybe 100 kilometers and here we have 40 kilometers. So we can somehow try to resolve uh, critical aspects in the ocean for uh, past, present, and future. Um, well, and what is then, what was the invention? And um, Klaus Hasselmann got his Nobel Prize in 2021 about that. We can run those models onto particular forcings. In this case, he has shown greenhouse gas emissions plus volcano plus natural forcing. And the black curve is, is the observations again, and the reddish curves are the model scenarios. And you see, okay, the, um, um, the model scenarios are somehow consistent with the observations. And we conclude um, that the uh, that the models are able to capture part of or large part of um, the um, last hundred years um, with greenhouse gases. If you drop the greenhouse gas forcing, that's the blue curve here in the lower panel, and then the model model runs are inconsistent with the black curve. That means there is um, it's it's not possible to explain. Um, the temperature rise of the last uh, decades without um, greenhouse gases. The, that was a nice invention and, and uh, many people contributed to this. Uh, but if you find out something, there's always a weak part. The critics is, at least from my side, is the time series are too short. And the estimates of natural variability, which is also essential, are only based on models. Um, so um, everything in this slide uh, is relying on, on model data. So what we have to do is to bring this uh, relatively recent warming and variability into a longer term context. What are the external forcings on longer term context? This is, um, Probably you know they're better than me. Here we have orbit orbital forcing at 20, 40, and 100 and 400 kilo years. Then of course we have the annual cycle. We have the uh, six month cycle and in, in the in the tropics. We have tides. So and we have um, that that all depends on the geometry on Sun Earth configuration and the. Um, oscillations of of the Earth and the Sun and the Moon. Um, and here in the 80s, we had a rough estimate, okay, what is climate variability? And this is uh, on the right-hand side, the panel. We have peaks, of course, in one year, one day. Then we have some peaks on so-called Milankovitch frequencies. 
And there's something in between. We have, for instance, weather, three to seven days, but all other things are rather uncertain. I will touch about this variability patterns. Pattern and mm -hmm. okay, what are the uh, astronomical forcing? We have this precession, the wobbling, the obliquity, the tilt, and the eccentricity, the shape of the ellipse. And it's clear that the precession is somehow related to the point where if we um, continue the rotation axis of the Earth on, on onto the sky, we are now looking basically at, um, at the Polaris uh, star, but um, in, in the future, we will look onto other fixed stars uh, like Vega in 10 or 11,000 years and so on. So basically our, our rule from childhood uh, continue the, um, the, oops, I shifted, the great bear or um, Großer Wagen, I, actually I don't know the English word. If we continue this uh, from this, this back here, then we enter up into the, into the polar star. That will change this rule. Okay, that will cause also different insulation. So for instance, in, in uh, today we are, the closest point is, is in January and the tilt of the axis is at, um, at uh, 23 and a half degrees. Um, so it's mm, more or less intermediate value of the, of the axis. So in, in other times, in, for instance, 9,000 years ago, so almost half a precessional cycle earlier, we have the perihelion in July. So we had more expressed summers. So we are closer to, to the Northern hemisphere um, to the sun and also the axis was more expressed. That means a stronger axis means also receiving more energy into higher latitudes um, um, as compared to, uh, to lower latitudes. And that incoming solar energy in the Northern hemisphere was 7% greater in July and correspondingly less in, in January. So this kind of forcing we have, and this is also a nice test bed for climate models, because you can calculate the astronomical forcing very well. It's a very uh, clear external forcing and we are interested in what is the response of the system. And I try to bring you some fundamental questions, at least what I think are some questions. And uh, yeah, this is just a slide which I always had in lectures, how many meters you, you have the, um, the effect of the obliquity on the position of Tropic of Cancer, that is in the highway of Mexico. And it's relatively easy to calculate the distance between um, the position of, of, uh, of the Tropic of Cancer from year to year. I was actually astonished to see that. And it's, it's a very nice exercise if you have, um, master students here, or if you're teaching, I think this is a very nice exercise. I just show it. You can calculate it by five, five min, five max from the tilt uh, uh, period of oscillations. And then the result is uh, 13 meters, uh, uh, 30 meters a, a year, how, how the, how the um, position of the, um, of, of the Tropic of Cancer changes. The insulation is is then also changing. Okay, we have uh, more insulation at six or nine kilo years before present in uh, boreal summer. It's up to forty watts per square meter, and less insulation in the lower latitudes. Um, in, uh, in especially in into boreal winter um, month, and this causes an effect on on. Uh, on climate and of course it's well known okay 6000 years ago or 6 to 9000 years ago the sahara was much greener and um, also in the, in the subtropics it received more rain there was a green sahara uh, the monsoon were enhanced um, what is an effect on sst don't look at the details 
you see up and warm trends in in the Holocene, and um, and and these up and warm uh, the, the trends are the follows. These are the dots. So basically, uh, bluish dots means cooling trends in the Holocene, and reddish dots means warming trends in the Holocene. So generally, um, the higher latitudes are cooling and the low latitudes are warming according to insulation. So we have uh, more energy in the mid Holocene than today. And uh, this is also then seen in the records. In the back, you see a particular model, um, but nearly all other models are showing similar things. Um, also cooling and warming. But the amplitude is quite different. If you look here on the right, the amplitude in a computer model is maybe a degree or half a degree cooling, whereas in the Iconon data, you see uh, three degrees also cooling. So quite um, a discrepancy in the amplitude, not so much in the pattern, but the amplitude is quite uh, dramatic. Um, one may also look at the spectrum, the power spectrum, the variability of, of the same records, basically. Um, and also on the computer model, so the computer model shows a flat spectrum, so um, not so much variability, some enhanced variability in centennial timescales here. Um, here is an artifact of the model, but um, the, the proxy data, also coral data and sediment cores, they had much, much higher variability in, in the data than in the model. Uh, orders of magnitude in between. Yeah, that, that's a really strong discrepancy. And the current climate models seem to underestimate the long-term variability. One can even bring that into uh, some theory. That was also uh, Hasselmann's idea to bring uh, climate into weather and, and uh, the uh, weather is basically the noise. Here is some damping factor, and here we have external forcing. It's like Brownian motion. You, you bring somehow um, external forcing, but we have a lot of random variability. And that is the weather and the big particles, the Brownian particles, the reddish ones are the climate particles. And they are then at this particular power spectrum with one over lambda square plus omega square. And the higher the lambda is, uh, the, the, the flatter is the spectrum. And uh, lambda is basically the damping factor. If you have a rubber gun, um, uh, um, if, if, if it's a stronger uh, thing, you have uh, a stronger relaxation. Um, if it's a weaker one, you have more variability. The same is, um, then the response is too low. That is also shown in the mean response. So basically ignore the left-hand side, just calculate the forcing and the change in, in temperature. Um, then we have, uh, uh, again, the, the response in the system is too low. That means um, the damping lambda is too high. And this is somehow, for me, at least the critical thing, because that would mean that climate models have not enough variability and they have also not enough um, response in, in the Holocene, um, in, in the Holocene trends in, in temperature. Uh, I think this is still not resolved. I will give you some direction how I think one can do more research. Um, namely, one can look at the resolution of climate models. And this is just some different phases of model intercomparison. So we have a three degrees resolution, now we have two. Now, more recent models have um, much higher resolution. And if you do a downscaling ocean, so really high resolution, you see it quite different. So the yeah. temperature decrease is much more expressed in higher resolution models than in lower resolution models. Why is, why is that? Um, one idea is, okay, um, we have, and here is also some data, um, we have this western boundary currents in the ocean, which has a specific structure. You see it on the upper right. This is typically not resolved by climate models, where we, where we, but in, in reality, we have really this band of high ve uh, velocities. And that yields also a stronger response in this area in terms of temperature. That is one uh, uh, 
the result. And the other one is that we have also more complex atmospheric circulation um, teleconnection for the for the response in the system where you need also higher resolution. And then we at least see this warm, cool, warm phase here. It's more complex also in the data. But in generally, I think it's it's much better than than the coarser resolution models. So I think he is somehow really nice uh, playground for modelers, namely looking at mechanisms which are responsible for for the right um, for the for the right um, amplitude and and the right pattern. So that basically is very um, very um, textbook like, namely we have on small scales, both in time and space, we have turbulence or tornadoes, things like that. Always, if you have a small scale feature, it's also very short lived. Um, whereas if you have ice ages, it's very long and global and something in between. So noptic variability, so basically weather is on intermediate um, uh, scales so, or uh, couple of uh, hundred kilometers and maybe a week or so. So that, that is somehow uh, the typical view we have on the climate system that spatial and temporal scales are somehow related. Um, as we saw, it's not the case in the previous slide, it's not related because we see also on small scales, we have strong gradients. That means um, spatial and temporal uh, variability are not necessarily uh, correlated. What is then also the implication for um, for climate variability? What what in in this case in the ocean, we have until now the the um, here is ocean velocity. This is a typical model output of ocean velocity. In the climate model, this is a very high resolution, and this is the frontier mesh. So we cannot run very long, but this is the result of um, of of a high resolution model. And this is satellite information, and it's nearly indistinguishable from observation. So that means we are now coming in terms of modeling to a new phase where we have a more realism and also more variability in the system giving uh, also more interesting structures. And uh, this may be also good to um, reduce the large uncertainties in regional changes and also um, extreme events, I think, are very important. So how, how many extreme events will occur in, in a warmer or colder climate? Uh, this is limited if we, if we have a coarse resolution model. This is one idea. Uh, one direction to go, and I think it's somehow promising. Um, I, I think I will skip that. Basically, it's also that the models have to be programmed in a suitable way that um, the available um, high-performance computing capabilities are really used. Um, this, is, this is some work uh, modelers have to do, and then the hope is then we that we can get rid of large uncertainties in regional climate projections um, and in climate scenarios coming from past and present and future. Um, now, the other uh, person who got the same year the Nobel Prize in, in climate uh, was uh, Manabi. And basically his finding is, or one of his findings, he had uh, many findings, is that the ocean has multiple states and and that um, under the same under the same forcing external boundary condition, he found out okay in one case the overturning um, this is shown here has a circulation like this with deep water formation in the north and recirculation, um, but under the same boundary condition, namely from today, we have also off mode, and the temperature and salinity was much reduced. Uh, this is in, from his publication in 88, so it's, it's relatively bad quality, sorry. So what is then, uh, why is it so interesting to analyze the ocean? Because it might have different multiple equilibria 
abrupt climate changes and it's very important to understand those um, also for for past present and future and i just want to give you one flavor what we did and i think it's um, somehow important that that was published uh, by by a colleague and mine and myself again gregor knorr we, what we found out that in glacial times uh, what we see is uh, here is um, temperature um, for um, present and um, and um, and glacial times. So uh, present is here and glacial times is B. But if we subtract uh, the temperature, is it's clear that the glacial uh, ocean is is much colder, four or five degrees colder. Uh, but what is even more prom uh, pronounced is also the salinity. So salinity has a much, much higher vertical stratification. That is the panel D here. Um, and you see here that um, that, that the one PSU or higher deep ocean salinity in, in glacial times compared to today. Um, and that is that is resulting in a huge um, difference in the vert vertical stratification of the ocean. And that made um, the ocean also uh, much uh, shallower. The deep water formation is, is much uh, more shallow. And all the models which have this feature of the deep, cold and salty water are more realistic in a way in order to uh, also resolve uh, the temperature behavior of the termination and and most models have problems to have the right uh, vertical stratification in in glacial times um, so recently what uh, we did is um, also looking at at the geometry of the deglaciation so here you see um, the evolution of the uh, land sea mask and um, yeah, since five or six thousand years ago, there's nothing really big change. Uh, but um, what is the effect of the deglaciation onto um, ocean mixing? I will now um, show some some uh, uh, ocean mixing slides in in the next couple of minutes. I have to close the door. Sorry, it's too noisy. Um, so here uh, is a glaciation. So what we found is there is a tidal dissipation. So how much energy um, is, um, is is lost via via tides, and that largely depends on the geometry of the ocean basin. And here you see um, there are different uh, tidal um, components. Maybe the details not so relevant. This M two mode which is somehow a resonance in the North Atlantic um, of, of the tidal uh, dissipation that strongly depends on, on the geometry. And funnily, that depends strongly on um, um, the Hudson Bay and, and this whole area with Labrador Sea. So quite different uh, dissipation energy by, by tidal motion and that changed over time. And I think that that is also a very interesting feature and also relevant for, for the interpretation of, of records. Um, what we find here is um, the tidal, um, um, this is the um, AMOC stream function in, in, in the Atlantic. Uh, red means uh, clockwise circulation and blue is anti-clockwise. That's a, Antarctic bottom water, so very shallow North Atlantic deep water. Um, that is for realistic uh, T and S, the temperature and salinity um, profiles in the Atlantic, uh, consistent with glacial um, proxy data. And here, if here the lower panel B is also with glacial tides, but present day T and S. And then it's quite quite different, it's, it's quite dramatic, the change. And then also the vertical, the, the, the tidal diffusivity is quite different 
depending on the stratification in the ocean. If we have a weak stratification, as for today, we have a strong mixing. And in glacial times, we have a weaker mixing because we have a big, uh, uh, very expressed stratification. So that's somehow what we are also working on is the, um, uh, the effect of the mixing onto the ocean. Um, I, I will come to that also in a minute, why I think it's rather fundamental. Um, yeah. So basically one um, conundrum of, of the Earth is in a way, um, we have this glacial interglacial variations in temperature, CO2 and sea level. We have in the future this, uh, what we expect, uh, warming scenarios also in sea level and in temperature. And if we look further more in, into the past, let's say more than 1 million years ago, we also experienced a much warmer climate also due to greenhouse gases and other, other effects. The question is, what is, uh, can we compare the, um, the, our recent climate warming and, and the future warming to this deep past warming? And one difficulty what we we'll see in data is our present day situation is like that. And in the past, in the deep paleo, we have much flatter temperature gradient. That means uh, Antarctica and, and, um, and the Arctic is, is much warmer than the rest of the globe. So the, the temperature distribution is, is quite, quite different. And really nobody knows what is the reason. Uh, a little bit, of course, um, there's a polar amplification, but uh, no model can really simulate this, um, this strong uh, polar warming. And what, is, uh, what, what can be the reason for that? We can ask ourselves about that. And I come somehow to a potential a mechanism where I think also mixing plays a role. So going back to the school book, of climate, so that's the first semester incoming equal outgoing radiation, and then we can calculate the temperature fourth root of something with solar and um, emissivity, and that works in a way, but it it contains also a thought mistake in my my view, um, namely we put a short wave equal long wave radiation and then calculate uh, the equilibrium temperature. But the Earth is not at all at equilibrium. It has a daily cycle. So that means on one side of the Earth, it's, um, it's uh, much uh, warmer than on the dark side of the Earth. Also the seasonality. So the, um, the, the fact that we ignore the time dependence of the temperature is somehow a mistake in this ansatz. And also where we don't see any of the heat capacity is also not included here in this equation. But um, if we look more carefully onto, onto this, we see that, uh, that if we have a very low heat capacity like the Mars or Venus, then the temperature would be quite different. So the, the heat capacity should be included in, in our formula. And also it matters how fast the Earth is rotating. If, if you have a much slow object in, in space, which is very slow, we have the dark side of the Earth would be much colder. So we need a very fast rotation and also very relatively high heat capacity of the Earth, and then we calculate the temperature. Uh, so basically, I, I, I'm saying, OK, what is happening is what we miss somehow in this conceptual idea the, that we trap heat um, and that we have a heat capacity like uh, the left hand, hand side here, Cp. Uh, times the uh, the time derivative of temperature is somehow related to the how much heat is trapped into the system and how this k if if we have an increase in k we we would um, um we would take more energy into into the deep ocean and this is observed also that 
that in um, that the most of the energy that was from the previous IPCC report is trapped in the ocean. It's not in the atmosphere. And that is related in, onto this uh, parameter K or the uh, take up of heat or of other traces as well. But this is the most unknown parameter in climate models. Um, it there are turbulence is included uh, in unknowns in turbulence in in wave breaking in mixing and everything. And uh, the if the geometry of the Earth is somehow changing, we might have even a different K, and and, and we need more um, more work on that. Here, what I did is just changing the K parameter, and then what we see, indeed, we we take more energy. And the high latitudes are warming a lot, and especially the thermocline is also deepening. So the whole climate is changing if we have a change in the in, in the vertical diffusivity mixing. And uh, I applied that also for the Pliocene and Miocene. We see similar things, um, although the geometry of the Earth was was a little bit different, especially in Miocene. Uh, simulations here, but we see again a very pronounced warming at high latitudes um, related to the vertical mixing in the ocean. So I think there's a potential to think more on weaknesses of models, but also think on uh, how the data can tell us about potential mechanisms of, of climate change, especially if we deal with warm climates. Um, yeah, finally, we are also playing now uh, with thresholds and and when ice was built up, that was a master thesis, and we are now evaluating what are thresholds in the in the system when we have built up of Antarctic ice, depending on uh, CO two level, and that is in collaboration with geologists at at our institute. They have marine cores, and and they can say under which uh, climate uh, time slice in the Eocene, Oligocene transition we had. Um, we had ice or no ice and which type of vegetation we had. And then we are evaluating now in, in climate models, where is a threshold to generate ice sheets. So here in 280 parts per million, it's, we have a big ice sheet. But in uh, under 840 parts per million, we had uh, only parts of the East Antarctic ice was, was there and uh, West Antarctic ice sheet was basically absent. So this is uh, the uh, direction we are, we are currently going, a combination of climate modeling, ice sheet modeling with marine records. Yeah, um, summarizing, I took that from from a book, actually, this author is living also in Bremen. He wrote a book what Angela Merkel is currently doing. It's just a science fiction in a way. She's doing now, she's now becoming a de detective. And what is a climate detective? I mean, we can take clues out of data theory and models. And what I try to emphasize is that paleoclimates gives us the long-term perspective of climate and identifying uh, driving mechanisms and, and more comprehensive understanding of, of Earth system science. And paleo data is, is an independent test of Earth system models to external forcing. Uh, maybe it's the only really independent test uh, uh, outside our, of our present day comfort zone of, of climate. And as some specific results I mentioned, um, yeah, the, the representation of decadal centennial variability in models was an was a, a issue. I, I was criticizing models um, that they were not able to have um, uh, longer term variability. But also, I would ask um, the data, they are typically not so representative if they're only at the coastal sites. But that has, of course, something to do um, with. Um, with, with the, the regional features where, where you retrieve such marine records. What I found out is a too low sensitivity to external forcing in climate models and, and too low variability might have 
the reason might be related to um, resolution issues in climate models. What I shortly touched about is the glacial background is, is a, in my view, a very um, interesting um, direction to look at what is the climate background in glacial times, what is then the relationship to climate change. The termination seemed to be a very good way to look at that, and we did more on that. But I, I wanted then to give you also more an outlook about heat and uptake and vertical mixing, and why I think also the tidal motion might be taken into account if you deal with climate change. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm I'm uh, interested in in a discussion. Thank you very much, Gary. Extremely, extremely interesting, at least for myself, I can talk. Uh, as uh, working on paleoclimate, what you're saying is very, very important. Um, but I leave the questions for the audience first. So as I don't see all the um, faces, just um, pop in and just ask. Unmute yourself and go ahead. I'm sure that Professor Loma will be happy to answer. Mm. Hopefully, I was not too fast, uh, but I tried to Otherwise, make it they are, more oh, general. Ravital, I yeah. see that Ravital and and unmuted. So yeah, I have a question. I don't know if you have an answer, but did you try to see how a specific catastrophic catastrophic events can affect their, um, your models? Mm. It's a good question. What What is a catastrophic events or what is... Um... I, I mean volcanic eruptions. Ah, okay. Yeah, we, we somehow we, we included that in the model. Um, mm, you see it here on this slide. It was more in the beginning. We, we included that, um, but it's I think uh, it's it's also a kind of weak point in, in climate models. Um, is is shown here. Um, so here are the big volcano events like Pinatubo uh, mm -hmm. or um, Santa Maria. Um, so they are the big volcanoes, or the more climate relevant uh, volcanoes are at at low latitudes because then the aerosols can go with the head laser into higher levels in, in, yeah. in the atmosphere. So um, somehow we include uh, these uh, volcano events in, in our climate models, but there's a <clears throat> relatively strong uncertainty. And uh, if you go further back in time, then we have uh, only limited information from ice core records and it's a bit guesswork where the volcano come from and and how how big was the event. Mm -hmm. But they, in principle, they're included. Uh, but it's a big uncertainty uh, if you deal with volcanoes. Okay. Mm. There are other events um, like um, um, like what what I showed is also some people would call it more an event than a variability. Uh, this strong warming here in in Greenland might be also called a strong, yeah. long lasting heat wave for 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 Greenland. Um, then it's difficult to distinguish between a um, long lasting event and and a trend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I think it's a very interesting question that that we have both events and. And let's say long-term trends. It's it's not so easy to distinguish them. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I will follow up a uh, vital subject actually with the events. Um. Uh, I you mentioned over there the Pinatubo, which we very strongly um experienced it in Israel, or at least in this part of the planet. I mean, the Dead Sea itself went up by, I think, 
0.5 meter or two meters, I don't remember. Ravitar remembers maybe. Yeah, two meters, yeah. Two meters, which is absolutely exceptional. And, and it was a lot of snow, I remember as well by myself. The, the precipitation, uh, the average precipitation was 200%. Um, so it was it was it doubled uh, in one year, which is really extreme in uh, in an area as like ours uh, at the at the fringe of the of the desert. So. Okay. But I but I wonder if you as a model you can see some kind. Can you predict or model? Sorry, not predict will not be the word. Model the different kind of uh, events because Pinatubo, for instance, will re the, the, no. Let me rephrase, the climatic impact of Pinatubo differs, or El Chichon differs from the climatic impact of uh, Tonga, which was um, a year ago. Now, mm -hmm. both of them, they are low, alti low latitude. Both of them, they were very strong, but the components that they injected into the atmosphere and stratosphere were, were different. So, are you able to put these differences in the model? In principle, yes. Um, um, the, the different uh, structure of the different volcanoes are, are included in, in the model. So the different source regions are included. Um, the question is how realistic is the outcome? Um, to be honest, I haven't looked at, at that beyond the global mean temperature as here mm. in in the ideal case also the regional impact would be uh, simulated well by climate models but um, it's <clears throat> very delicate to have uh, let's say um, the, the result um, on, on a regional scale um, of, of a global climate model to be um, very realistic, but if you're interested, I I can have a look on on that. I'm also interested in that, but I I had uh, that's the first time that people ask me about that. So, well, I, in principle, I can look at the different responses of of these events on let's say precipitation in Europe, Europe and Asia and and Israel. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I will be very much interested because as much as I understand the influence of Tonga. Is actually the opposite of Pinatubo, okay. because it injected a lot of water in the upper atmosphere, stratosphere, and the other one was, I mean, was a different component. As much as I understood, but I, I, we, we don't know yet. I think it's very recent. Okay. Yeah. I, I will also. Yeah. Sorry. So, sorry. I, I just said that I will also be happy to send you a paper that we wrote about the influence of, on, of uh, volcanic eruptions on the Dead Sea level yeah. uh, during the, the glaciation uh, about, uh, I think, 12,000 years ago, and okay. um, where you see a really uh, large increase of runoff that um, is, very, is very strange. And I wonder, it was just, we suggested a correlation with volcanic eruptions based on the um, the uh, Greenland ice core record. Um, and it, I always thought it would be interesting to see if it can fit some kind of a model um, yeah. or, or it is just a bad assumption. I don't know. So, so basically you're, you're saying in the, in the Younger Dries there was a big volcano? No, there were a few volcanic, uh, volcanic eruptions. Um, and it's the, the volcanic eruptions are, are not related to the Dead Sea, but what we saw is that during the desiccation of the, the Lake Lisan towards the Dead Sea, the lake level was not just going down, but it was fluctuating um, and it, okay. has, it had peaks and the peaks were correlated in time and in the, by intensity uh, to volcanic eruptions. So I don't know if the correlation is valid, but if it is valid, it will be interesting to see if uh, it can be modeled and uh, yeah. explained. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think let's start first with easy last hundred years. Um, <laughs> um, um, the, uh, the problem is uh, in this past volcano events, um, uh, people have just the information from ice cores. I, yeah. I mm -hmm. And then it's 
a very yeah yeah, yeah. a lot of assumptions yeah. yeah so if if the pattern makes sense for um let's say the last big volcano events then one can look also in the past but i'm interested uh, maybe this plays also a big role for uh, for for the deglaciation, I, I cannot mm -hmm. exclude that. They also we worked a little bit on that how um, climate and um, and the carbon cycle, the marine carbon cycle, are related in terms of um, uh, in uh, mid ocean ridges, and so there there is also um, uh, there are also feedbacks which are more complex. With the solid earth and and ocean circulation, mm -hmm. um, I I think it's we tried that also uh, was published Nature Com, but I I feel it's still on a very preliminary stage, and mm -hmm. it might explain something which is um, difficult to understand uh, with um, carbon cycle and climate feedbacks. For instance, in the stage um, four. It's not obvious why why there is somehow a decoupling of carbon and uh, or CO two records and and climate. So the, it might might give us some clues which we have overlooked. Also, it's a weak point in climate models. This um, volcanoes. If you look also in the future, um, nobody knows if if big volcanoes will will appear in in the next hundred years or so. Which would save us somehow if, if we have some big volcanoes, uh, the 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 warming would be much reduced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I have another question. If somebody has another one, probably uh, re well related to humans, I get that humans we are making a mess for all the modeling, huh? Hmm. There is a new tendency to also model humans as um, a population and population density. And there are new, some new approaches on that. Uh, also, early humans, how they migrate from out of Africa to um, actually, they cross uh, most human migrations cross Israel. Some yeah. went through the Strait of Bab el Mandeb with uh, small uh, ships. And this is um, modulated also by the precessional cycle. So basically, yeah. but basically the the um, the vegetation in this region is strongly dependent on 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 the on the on the precessional cycle, and you see it also in the, the recent past nine thousand years ago. That that the, the Sahara was greener and there were animals and people were hunting uh, that and that probably causes a green passage to to Asia and Europe. Uh, uh, for for future and recent climate, of course, there are also human models. Um, um, that is also related. It's more complex to, uh, for recent and future. Uh, because um, it not only depends on climate, it depends also on uh, industry and future developments, innovations. There, there are many models about that, actually. But I, I feel it's too complex. <laughs> uh, the past is yeah, somehow this, easier. Um, yeah, this, this is what I wanted to hear. What is your position about uh, that? <laughs> yeah, the, the early... The early... Um, men and and the early um, human migrations depends more on climate than our present day climate they were more dependent because they're hunting and uh, picking things and uh, what so what is cool. your position about when did humans no let's say ah. when the behavior of humans stopped to be extrinsic and started to be intrinsic considering climate change. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. That is you good. did like what, two million years ago, three million years ago, one million years ago? Because at one moment we, obviously climate always will be one of the major factors in our evolution and, and, and patterns of migration. 
still now, by the way. But yeah. there is, but now you have access to water in the supermarket and access to clothing. So you know, yeah. it's a, it's an intrinsic. You don't need, right? But there is a moment in time in which we move to be from extrinsic to in, intrinsic. Yeah. What is your position? That's a very good question. Um... I mean, for me, I have more questions than answers, of course. And yeah, like, like like myself. <laughs> yeah, and uh, why uh, why uh, in in the Holocene and not in in the Emian we had this uh, um, evolution of settlements? Uh, why why in in the previous glacial cycles? I mean, we had many. Why only now? Um, the higher evolution of of uh, society has developed and not earlier. I don't know. It's it's. I think it's not clear. I think we don't have the answer yet. <laughs> no, but it's interesting. And uh, I I tried now with this tune to to run a model for human development, but it's 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 too early. I I have no idea. Yeah. To Okay, I have more questions, but probably in another time. So I will leave the, if nobody has questions, somebody has a question in the chat. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah. Um, Gabriel is asking, there are temperature data that you showed in past million years, uh, indicating higher temperature at some point compared to now. Please, can you explain other reasons for that? One of our students. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what was a million years or a thousand years? Millions. Million. Um, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's a good question here. In I guess it's related to this figure. Mm. Yeah, sorry. This figure. Mm. Here is yeah. uh, the time scale is is changing. And indeed, the last million years is more or less dominated by variations on glacial interglacial variability on 40 and 100 kilo years. And uh, prior to that time, um, the uncertainty in CO2 is, is rather big. Uh, here it's in this figure, I tried to make it that big, but I think in reality it might be much bigger. But what is clear is um, we had times also in the Miocene and earlier parts in the Eocene, um, Oligocene, we had much higher CO2 levels than pre industrial levels, which is uh, 280. So the starting point of the modern times, um, 1850 or so, that, that starts with. Uh, 280 and then we we are now increasing by by humans um the co2 concentration and depending on us actually we will end up at thousand or whatever 600 uh, parts per million and uh, in the past we had also more co2 in the atmosphere which is difficult to measure because in the co2 records is very easy or relatively easy to measure in the ice cores but uh, prior to that time, we have only indirect measurements of uh, marine sediments, um, also um, it's, it's, it's indirect. And therefore we have to, the best is to mix or to, to have an idea about different archives and their meaning to the carbon cycle. So it's, but it's clear that uh, the carbon dioxide was higher in, in the past uh, deep times. <clears throat> And uh, that, that raises interesting questions. Um, what is the climate sensitivity? So how much warming we um, expected with um, increase in carbon dioxide and other trace gases? The problem is, for instance, methane cannot be reconstructed at all. So some trace gases are, or greenhouse gases are not, not at all uh, constrained or very weakly constrained with carbon isotopes. But it, it's 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 a new direction of research or 
more recent direction of research to to deal with um, past climates which were much warmer than today and um, according to this uh, time series maybe 10 degrees warmer or so than today um, and, and the question is yeah uh, probably the carbon cycle the question is why the carbon cycle or why the uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases were higher so we came from a warmer climate and then we are cooling, we, we have cooled the earth. I think it's also not clear um, why this happened. So some of the carbon dioxide was used to build up trees and and deep sea um, uh, deep sea carbon. Uh, and that that is what we are currently using back again to and in, in put that to the to the atmosphere. So we are doing the opposite what nature has done i think i think i love i love i really like this figure and i use it for teaching by the way so thank you oh thanks <laughs> and uh what i i i think i always say that basically we're living in the same um third rock from the sun but it was not the same planet so whatever it is 40 million years ago it's not the same planet that we are living right now it's the same rock but it's not the same planet because over there we had a tethys ocean which is not existing anymore yeah. i believe that the co2 the high co2 concentration are related to the tethys ocean which was a shallow and carbonate kind of uh, a huge carbonate platform which definitely had some uh, kind of input into the system which doesn't exist anymore so maybe w this is one thing that i explain i don't know if it's true by the way but yeah. true in 100 percent but um but we were living in a different planet, basically. And not yeah. to mention what is happening when the Atlantic Ocean didn't exist, which yeah. is before the 60, 70 or whatever million, right? Yeah. So there was a different planet. So we have a, a cycles of planets, one planet yeah. A, planet B, planet C, and now we are in planet D or whatever, you know? Yeah, and that's it, right. But it's the, same, it's the same rock, but it's a different planet. Yeah, but um, I mean, there's still the same mechanisms, so it's, it's very interesting to look at these different uh, configurations, I call them. Um, yeah. But in, indeed, it's it's quite different. And in in the um, now when I go first here yeah, to to this the, the configuration, if even in the Miocene yeah. we had this connection here. Yeah. Uh, and if you you're right, if you if you go deeper in time, ninety million years, uh, Cretaceous. There was almost no Atlantic, uh, very narrow Atlantic. It, it didn't make a function in the global climate. You didn't have the Gulf Stream and you know, yeah. you didn't have cooling. Yeah. I just wonder if in the long term, because you show that graph of high CO2, low CO2, and we are getting high, which is human based, so obviously. Yes. But in general, maybe there is a huge side mega cycle of several millions of years of a lot of CO2. Low, low, high CO2, low CO2, high CO2, low CO2, like that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's a scale of 40 million, but if you if maybe if you go for 400 million, yeah. then you will have a cycle. I mean, I don't know because the resolution yeah. go less and less when you yeah. go back in time. We don't know that, but maybe there is also a cycle in this. Why not? Yeah. No, we have to be open for these ideas. Um, even even for glacial interglacial, um, I mean, the hundred kilo years, what we experienced in the last um, eight hundred thousand years, is the forcing is very weak on uh, one hundred. So, I, I believe that a part of the external forcing is coming by by obliquity, uh, forty kilo year cycle, but then also part of internal internal variability of the carbon climate cycle, which is has maybe a time scale of 100. So we have a kind of pick, uh, picking a specific time scale by orbit, but also internally. <laughs> and, and maybe that's true for, for long time scales as well. Um, I'm not a specialist in that, but it's interesting. Yeah, we'll need, to, we'll need to close the discussion. Probably we will have more people are leaving and also people already started another lesson. So, yeah. Gary, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I hope that uh, you will be able to come or to come to Haifa.
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I will do so. Thanks thank for your patience. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.